Good morning students, today is uh, uh, lecture 11 of module 4. So, in today's lecture, uh, we will discuss uh, about the characterization of ionic membranes and characterization of non-porous membranes. So, various techniques one by one we will see. So, uh, before uh, we uh, move on, let us understand what are ionic membranes. So, uh, if you uh, remember uh, during our introduction class and during our uh, discussion on classification of membrane and membrane processes, we have uh, briefly discussed what are ionic membranes. So, if you recall, um, we can have three different types of ionic membranes. One is called cation exchange membrane, another is called uh, anion exchange membrane and one is bipolar membrane. So, a cation exchange membrane is something uh, in which there are fixed anionic groups. So, it is exchanging cations. So, that is the name actually. Similarly, in anion exchange membranes, they have fixed cations and they are exchanging anions. And bipolar membrane is something uh, in which both cations and anions uh, fix, uh, are uh, present as fixed charges. But they are separated by a particular layer or layer there is a layer of separation in between two different charge groups. So, a bipolar membrane has its own specific applications. Now, uh, charged membranes or ion exchange membranes are not only employed in electrically driven processes such as electrodialysis and membrane electrolysis, but also in non-electrical potential uh, processes such as reverse osmosis, nanofiltration, microfiltration and ultrafiltration. Uh, if ionic membrane is in direct contact with an ionic solution, then what happens? Uh, uh, what will happen basically? There will be distribution of ions, and uh, uh, the solution uh, and the and the distribution of ions will be uh, present in two different phases. Some of the ions will uh, come and sit on the surface of the membrane, so they will become immobile because there will be charged interaction between the surface groups already present on the charged membrane and their counter ions and there will be distribution also inside the membrane. So, uh, this distribution will continue till the donor equilibrium is reached and then if the membrane has a negative fixed charge, then ions of opposite charge uh, like positively charged ion or their counter ions will be attracted to the membrane surface uh, and while the uh, ions of the same charges are repelled from the membrane surface So and, and vice versa. So, in this way electric double layer is actually formed. So, uh, let us closely look into this particular figure uh, which is showing you the electrical potential as a function of distance. Now, two regions can be observed in the electrical double layer, uh, a layer of fixed ions at the surface which are rather immobile since ions are bound to the surface by electrical forces. So, basically what is happening there are ions, this is your membrane actually right. So, here some ions will come and deposit on the surface correct and uh, by virtue of the uh, charge exchange between them, so they will become immobile, uh, they are not in the dispersed medium right. So, that is the fixed ions at the surface which are immobiles okay, and they are bound to the surface the, by the by some charge uh, um, uh, this one exchange and electrical forces whatever you can say in that way. So, further away from the surface ions becomes more mobile and their, their layer is called diffusive layer. So, somewhere here we can say okay, while you come down side somewhere here. So, I can try to draw something here. So, let us say this is actually uh, the membrane ok. So, when the ions are coming and the, the, they are ok getting deposited on the surface of the membrane. So, this particular group we can call fixed ions ok. Then above this there are also ions are coming here ok. Few ions are also getting deposited on the surface. It is just something like concentration polarization that we discussed uh, long back if you remember recall how it happens actually monolayer deposition, bilayer deposition that it goes on ok. So, here actually this diffusive region comes ok. So, this is here x the distance from the surface of the membrane. Now, um, uh, between these results there is something called a stern layer. Okay, you you might have heard about stern potassium many times. Okay, so this is what is called. You can see this is the uh, from here. Okay, so this is your stern surface, and the corresponding potential is the stern potential. This one. Okay, phi delta. So if ionic solution is forced to flow along the surface, and the mobile ions will flow along a layer of more immobile ions, and the shear plane can be determined experimentally. What we are going to determine is basically the shear plane and the potential at this year is called a zeta potential ok. One of the most important features or characterization parameter uh, for uh, membranes as well as polymers and other uh, materials also ok. However, the stone potential the value is higher than the zeta potential. So, you can see this is the zeta potential ok. 
often it is assumed that ions in the solution are uniformly distributed and the electric potential decreases exponentially with distance that can be expressed by this particular equation phi equals to phi naught exponential to the power of minus k x. Now, uh, at a distance of k inverse. Now, what is k inverse? Now, k inverse is known as the Debye length. Okay. So, the potential has decreased to a value of exponential um, to the power of minus 1. So, that is 0.37 and this value is frequently taken as the potential which gives the thickness of the double layer. So, this a value actually uh, is the thickness of the uh, gives the thickness of the double layer. Okay. Uh, the specific properties which we can measure of, um, uh, by uh, uh, for this particular membranes, ionic membranes. So, they are surface charge, zeta potential, electrical resistance and ionic uh, permeability. Now, let us, uh, uh, this is what we discussed in general about the uh, ionic membranes and how, uh, how the charge uh, electrical potential actually plays an important role in uh, uh, characterizing the uh, ionic membranes. Now, we will discuss in general different types of, um, sorry one by one different types of uh, ionic uh, membrane characterization techniques. So, uh, under this the first one is called electrokinetic phenomenon. Now, electrokinetic phenomenon provides information about the charge density and zeta potential. Okay. It tells us two things, right? Uh, it will uh, tells us about the, it will give the uh, charge density as well as zeta potential of the surface. Now, zeta potential gives effective surface charge and this parameter may be obtained from the streaming potential measurements. Okay. A streaming potential when the streaming potential is generated that also we need to understand. So, what will happen? So, when an ionic solution is forced to flow through a charged pore, so a, a, uh, there is a porous membrane and uh, the porous membrane uh, is having certain uh, let us say uh, charged pore or capillary or slit then by applying uh, a hydrodynamic pressure okay, due to a simultaneous transfer of mass transfer mass and charge a streaming potential will be generated. right? Now, the electrical potential uh, uh, donated by this delta phi uh, uh, which has been generated by the flow of ions due to an applied uh, driving force delta P is determined by a very high resistance voltmeter. So, you need a voltmeter. So, the, uh, actually uh, um, uh, to measure zeta potential there are uh, particular instruments they are also costly, okay. but in a crude way also in the labs also zeta potential and uh, uh, streaming potential also can be measured. Okay. Now, we will discuss actually how it happens. So, you can see uh, there are two uh, figures here. So, capillary tube or U tube manometer type of uh, arrangements in uh, which are holding porous membrane as well as non porous membrane. So, porous membrane is fixed here. So, this is actually your porous membrane and this is non porous membranes are arranged in a slit. Okay. Since they do not have pores, so they are arranged in a particular way uh, as slits. Okay. Then what is happen? You can see there are electrodes here. Okay, uh, both sides of the membrane there are electrodes and then uh, voltage is applied. Okay. So, uh, we are varying the applied pressure, uh, what we are doing actually we are varying the delta P that means the pressure. Okay. Then electrical potential difference is measured, corresponding electrical potential difference. Now, the streaming potential the delta phi by delta um, uh, P is related to the zeta potential uh, by this equation which is called Helmholtz uh, Smolochewski equation. Okay. So, it is uh, delta phi by delta p equals to epsilon zeta okay. uh, then uh, eta k. So, where k is the electrical conductivity of the solution right epsilon is the permittivity of the solution or the dielectric constant. So, um, epsilon equals to epsilon naught epsilon r with epsilon naught is given it is a constant basically 8.85 10 power of minus 12. Okay, c square by n meter square that is actually permittivity of vacuum and epsilon r equals to 80 as relative dielectric constant. So, and eta is the viscosity in Pascal per second. So, what we are going to do is this uh, once uh, in a per this particular type of arrangement please uh, uh, look at the figure once again. Uh, so, here uh, electrodes are placed and the charges and voltages are applied at, okay. and we are varying the uh, delta P and measuring the uh, corresponding electrical difference right. and from this particular Helmholtz and Smolochewski equation we can find out what is the uh, streaming potential. 
So, now please look at this particular figure. Okay. So, here, here uh, this is also tells you about what is zeta potential. Okay. You can see that the surface is charge is negative. This is for example. Okay. It is not that all surfaces are negatively charged. Surfaces can be positively charged also. Okay. So, then their corresponding uh, ions which will be deposited on immediately on the surfaces will be the negatively charged. Just at the inverse of this phenomena what is being shown here. You can see this is the surface. Right. This is the surface. Okay. So, here uh, since the surface is negatively charged, so the immediate ions uh, which are attached to the surface is are all positively charged ions and then there is a layer which is surrounding on the surface of this particular uh, um, uh, positively charged ions. So, that is called actually stern layer. So, you can see that corresponding potential here actually you can see. So, this is the stern potential and this is what is your surface potential. Then what is happening? So, what is zeta potential? So, zeta potential actually is the potential difference between the dispersion medium. So, this is the dispersion medium here okay. and the stationary layer of fluid attached to the dispersed particle. So, this is a particle which is negatively charged over that surface um, uh, positively charged particles are there and that layer actually is given your stern layer. Above that there are certain ions uh, both positive and uh, ch negatively charged ions. So, they are existing uh, in a layer however, they are loosely uh, dispersed okay. and however, uh, uh, though that they are loosely dispersed. So, above there there is a layer existing okay, or we can call it a slipping uh, plane here. Okay. So, that is actually the zeta potential. So, here you can see this layer. Okay. So, this is giving my zeta potential. right? So, um, uh, zeta potential actually is uh, given uh, though uh, many times we write actually uh, it is a particular value however it is a range many times. So, you can see zeta potential and the stability behavior. So, this is for the colloids right the stability behavior which I am showing here is this is for the colloids if it is uh, it can be plus and minus both positive or negative if the zeta potential is from 0 to plus minus 5 then rapid coagulation or flocculation will occur. If it is plus minus 10 to plus minus 30 then stability will be in incipient and if it is plus minus 30 to plus minus 40 it is moderate stable. If it is plus minus 40 to plus minus 60 the stability will be good and anything that is greater than 61 will have excellent stability. Now, this please remember that whatever I am showing this this stability behavior is for the colloidal dispersion as uh, this zeta potential actually is measured initially it is for the colloids and uh, it was derived like that. So, the uh, streaming potential is independent of flow geometry that is a capillary or a slit gives the same results providing that the charge densities are the same. right? The determination of the potential provides information of the effective surface charge. However, it must be realized that zeta potential is not a constant but dependent on the ionic environment. Now, immediately you change the ionic environment the zeta potential value will change. So, you cannot say that for this particular membrane the zeta potential is this then you have to tell that what is the environment uh, under which this particular zeta potential measurement is carried out. Now, uh, it is dependent on two parameters first is the surface charge of the membrane and then ionic strength. Uh, the surface charge may be strongly dependent on the pH of the environment. Now, the ionic strength depends on the concentration and valency of the ions and given by this particular equation where i equals to 0.5 summation of C i z i square i is the ionic strength and C i is the concentration of the ions z i is the valency of ions. Uh, please look at this particular uh, figure this was what I was just telling the slide before that an increase in the ionic strength results in a decrease in the double layer thickness and uh, this was k uh, inverse which is the Debye length and of its zeta potential. So, when you are increasing the ionic strength so the double layer th thickness actually is getting decreased. Okay. So, uh, the zeta potential will also decrease okay. uh, this particular figure shows us that. Uh, now, close look, uh, have a close look at this particular figures. There are two distinct figures I am showing here okay, to understand more about little better about the zeta potential. Here you can see this uh, this particular left hand side figure. Okay, so, it is showing the zeta potential of alumina and zirconia as a function of pH. Okay. So, alumina and zirconia are uh, materials to prepare ceramic membranes, inorganic membranes. right? So, what it says this particular figure says this, this, this particular figure from here uh, we are finding zeta potential absolutely true, but we can still understand uh, in a very better way that at heart what particular uh, pH okay, that particular material whether alumina or zirconia will be either positively charged or negatively charged. Right? So, you can see that alumina is positively charged 
till almost somewhere here may be it is 9 around ok. Beyond that 9, 9.2 or something like that. So, alumina is positively charged. Now, um, you can uh, please look at this right hand side figure you can see this uh, it is a zeta potential as a function of pH is given right. So, uh, um, you can see this here this is the isoelectric point. Now, what is the meaning of isoelectric point? So, uh, it is the point in which there is no net electrical charge. Now, isoelectric point which is called as uh, IEP okay, or uh, PI many times it is written like that right. So, that is basically uh, a point where there is no electrical charges, there is no net electrical charges. Now, do not confuse with point of 0 orders or point of 0 charge many times they are loosely uh, used both these terms ok. Now, you can understand that uh, uh, here you can see this particular region which is marked like this ok. This particular region tells us that this region is highly unstable ok. Let us say uh, from the pH here it may be somehow around uh, 3 point or something like that or here it will be around uh, 7.4 or something like that ok. I am just telling approximately right and just to uh, make you understand. So, uh, for this uh, this is for a particular actually uh, material I do not un, uh, remember actually what is that material right. And uh, 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 above that uh, let us say from uh, pH 2 to uh, 3.8 or something like that uh, the uh, uh, material is very very stable and again be, uh, uh, above 7.5 to 12 around uh, 12 the material uh, the system or material is very very unstable. Uh, ok. When you draw this particular uh, figure uh, zeta potential uh, um, and the pH we can understand uh, the stability and unstability as well as we can find out the isoelectric point. Now, uh, the next uh, characterization technique uh, is electro osmosis phenomenon. Now, electro osmosis is another electrokinetic phenomena only in which the electric field is applied across a charged porous membrane or a slit of two charged non porous membrane ok. This can be used for a porous membrane also uh, if I am using uh, uh, a non porous membrane then I have to make a slit of these two non porous membranes. Now, due to applied potential difference in electric current will flow and water molecules will flow when the ions with the ions generating a pressure difference. Uh, because electro osmotic velocities are independent of conduit size as long as electrical double layer is much much smaller than the characteristic length of the channel electro osmotic flow will have very very little effect. So, this means it is telling that um, uh, the, uh, electro, the velocity of the electro osmotic uh, force uh, actually uh, uh, that is uh, independent of the conduit size in which we are measuring actually right. But however, uh, this uh, this will have no effect uh, if the electrical double layer is very very small to that of the length the characteristic length of the tube or the conduit whatever you, you can say. So, electro osmotic flow is caused by the coulomb force induced by an electric field on net mobile electric charge in a solution. Now, because the chemical equilibrium between a solid surface and an electrolyte solution typically leads to the interface acquiring a net fixed electrical charge, a layer of mobile ions known as electrical double layer or Debye layer forms in the region near the interface. This is what we just discussed earlier also. So, there is a surface here, ok. Let us say there is a surface here, this is surface, ok. So, charged, charged surface, right. So, uh, some uh, ions will come and deposit. Now, what is the the ions positive or negative depends upon what is the charge of this surface ok. Then again there will be a loosely bound ions. So, this is a fixed layer that I uh, that we have already discussed fixed ions they are immobiles. Then we have uh, loosely attached or dispersed a particular dispersed layers. So, they are mobile. So, this is particularly actually this layer will form the electrical double layer or Debye layer ok. So, this that is forming near the interface. So, uh, when an electric field is applied to the fluid usually by electrodes placed in as um, both sides inlets and outlets we just saw how it was done uh, using a YouTube uh, manometer type of system. Uh, the net charge in the electrical double layer is induced to move by the resulting coulomb force the resulting flow is termed as electro osmosis flow. You can see actually how the electro osmotic flow takes place uh, here this particular uh, slide uh, figure will tell you. Now, the equation below indicates the electro osmosis and streaming potential are similar ok. So, dv by dt which is the generator flow and uh, equals to epsilon i zeta eta by k by eta k. So, i is the current. 
So, a unique relationship between electro osmosis and streaming potential can be obtained. So, uh, the streaming potential delta phi by delta p equals to dv by dt by i. So, uh, from this equation we can understand that there is a relationship between the um, streaming potential as well as the electro osmosis flow. Now, electrosmotic flow is an essential component in chemical separation techniques uh, notably capillary electrophoresis. Now, electrosmotic flow can occur in natural unfiltered water as well as buffer solution also. So, now let us understand the characterization of non-porous membranes. So, we will exclusively discuss about non-porous membranes and uh, non-porous membranes are um, uh, used to perform separations on a molecular level. However, rather than molecular weight or molecular size, the chemical nature and morphology of the polymeric membrane and the extent of interaction between the polymer and the permeants are important factors to be considered. So, now you understand that when we are talking about actually porous membranes. So, you are finding out uh, certain parameters which are essentially a integral part of the porous membrane. So, what are those pore size, pore size distribution, pore volume all these things porosity, surface porosity because uh, they have uh, fixed pores right. But in uh, non porous membrane when there are no pores, so what we are going to uh, um, characterize and how the separation is happening. Now, the parameters which will affect the non porous membrane separation are basically the chemical nature and morphology of the membrane. It may be polymeric, it can be anything else also, but mostly it is polymeric only. So, what is the membrane material? The membrane material and its um, uh, uh, characteristic features both physico chemical parameters uh, actually will uh, define the rate of separation at how the separation is going to happen. So, that is not all. Then the extent of interaction between the polymer and the permeate, the permeate which is going to be um, uh, to the permeate side or we are to, uh, want to reject uh, basically taking it to the uh, permeate side or passing through the membrane. Okay. Their interaction and the interaction between the polymer is also very, very important. So, that means let us say let us understand the solute is getting transported to the uh, through this particular non porous membrane. So, what is the interaction of this particular solute with that membrane material is very important. Now, we have never uh, taken into consideration the membrane material and its feature when you discuss non porous membrane. Though it uh, though in charged membranes they have certain uh, importance. However, uh, the importance is more in case of non porous membranes. Now, transport through non porous membranes occurs by solution diffusion mechanism and the separation can be achieved either by difference in solubility or diffusion. This is how, but uh, so, uh, the solution diffusion students will discuss in detail when we will discuss uh, our transport models and all. Okay, now, for uh, for this for today's class try to understand that uh, this non porous membrane how it is happening, how the transport will happen when there are no pores. So, what will happen? The solute will come and get dis, uh, deposited on the surface of the membrane here. Yeah? right then they they have to be dissolved in the membrane material right so that is why okay its solubility is very important right solubility of what solubility of solute inside the membrane material the once they are dissolved now they will have to diffuse okay by virtue of the potential difference now that is why diffusivity comes into picture so the solute's diffusivity plays a very important role now once they come to come across the permeate side they will dissolve now, this is what is called a solution uh, diffusion mechanism where solubility and diffusivity of the solute okay, inside the membrane material is the mechanism of transport. Uh, the determination of physical properties related to the chemical structure is now more important and in this respect the following methods will be discussed. So, we will be discussing permeability, uh, different physical properties, plasma etching and surface analysis. These methods we will discuss um, as characterization techniques for the non porous membrane. So, the first one is permeability method. So, you remember we discussed permeability of uh, how to calculate uh, uh, water flux and all during our porous membrane characterization also microfiltration membrane. Now, uh, we will quickly discuss about the permeability method here in non porous membrane also. Now, here actually instead of uh, uh, water here um, we are using gas because uh, since uh, the, the um, water flow inside the non porous membrane will be very difficult that is why uh, gas is being used as a source uh, or permeant, per permeant that will uh, pass through the membrane. So, you are uh, you can see this schematic measurement it is very simple. So, there is a membrane module here. Okay. So, this one which is holding the membrane okay. then you can uh, pass the gas from particular uh, from a gas source usually the gas cylinders and you can measure the flow here the permeate flow right by using a sub bubble meter or a mass flow meter. It is very simple technique. 
Now, the cell containing a homogeneous membrane of non thickness is pressurized with, uh, with a Susan gas. Now, the extent of gas permeation through the membrane is measured by means of a mass flow meter or by a soft bubble meter. The permeability coefficient P can be determined by a steady state gas flow if the membrane thickness L is known. Okay. Now, membrane thickness L can be um, uh, characterized or found out by various mechanisms, usually the electron microscopy uh, like uh, SAM or FESM. So, uh, J equals to P by L. So, here J is the gas flow per unit pressure okay, and L is the membrane thickness in centimeter. So, P is expressed uh, per unit membrane area, per unit time, per unit driving force. Now, uh, pure liquid is contained in the reserve air. Now, when we talk about actually um, uh, uh, liquid permeability, the uh, uh, mechanism uh, uh, by which uh, both uh, air permeability or gas permeability and liquid permeability are uh, uh, this one uh, carried out are mostly the same. So, the liquid is contained in the reserve in the, in the upstream side of the membrane and its temperature being controlled by means of heating coils. Okay. So, here the liquid this is the membrane right, here the liquid is there. Now, the vacuum is applied on the downstream side and the pressure applied via any suitable vacuum gas. Now, if you recall what we discussed the liquid permeability and the water permeability or water flux measurement uh, during the microfiltration membrane characterization, then that time we have not vacuumized the system, the downstream system, okay, downstream side of the membrane that was not done. Only how much of liquid is that is uh, coming out, okay, right. So, that is being measured. Now, since liquid will not come out as it is so easily in for a porous non porous membrane that is why a vacuum is uh, required uh, at the permeate sites needs to be created. So, the liquid flow will take place, takes place. So, the actually the vacuum is applied on the downstream side as you can see this is the permeate side. So, the liquid is uh, so the vacuum is um, uh, applied there. Right. So, you can uh, do it by uh, having a vacuum pump or vacuum gas. So, the downstream pressure must be less than about one tenth of the saturation pressure of the pure liquid at that temperature in order to obtain a maximum driving force. Now, the permeating liquid through membrane is evaporated on the downstream side and collected in the condenser which is cooled with a liquid nitrogen or other uh, cooling agent. The amount of liquid can be determined simply by weighing. So, the next is physical methods. So, under the physical properties which are associated with uh, polymers or mem polymeric membranes uh, are glass transition temperature, crystallinity and density. So, some of these techniques include the DSC which is called differential scanning calorimetry and differential thermal analysis DTA methods. Now, differential scanning calorimetry determines the energy dq by dt that is necessary to counteract any temperature difference between the sample and the reference. There is a sample and there is a reference. Okay, sample is uh, something which we are going to measure the um, uh, transition and there is a reference. We will discuss in our next slide about this and in DTA the differential thermal analysis this determines the temperature difference delta T okay, between the sample and the reference upon heating or cooling. So, let us understand what is DSC here. So, the sample and reference standard heated under identical thermal condition in two separate furnaces provided for sample and reference. So, there are two furnaces, okay, not from not the single furnace as the case of DTA. So, you can see here uh, this furnace is holding the sample, this furnace is holding the uh, reference. Now, and uh, both sample and references are getting heated or heat is being supplied to them and uniform heat is being supplied to them. Now, as sample undergo change in state, right. So, the latent heat of transition will be absorbed or dissolved depending upon what is the sample and the temperature of sample differs from that of the reference material, right. So, because the material is degrading either it is absorbing heat or it is de um, dissolving heat. So, as temperature of one of the material uh, of one material lag behind other extra heat is injected okay, to material to keep the temperature differences 0. So, that means what is happening? Uh, so, there is a sample and there is a reference. Okay, both are supplied equal amount of heat. Now, reference is a inert material it will not thermally degrade uh, will not degrade nothing will happen to it. So, what is but the mat uh, sample uh, which is uh, uh, being kept um, there okay, under uh, the thermal under the temperature uh, this one uh, so that is the or the heat that is being supplied uh, to this sample uh, it will degrade. Okay. So, degradation may be either it is absorbing or dissolving or whatever it is depending upon the type of the material nature of the material. So, it is it's, it's, uh, this one uh, uh, temperature will drop or uh, will increase. So, it will not be equal to that of the reference material. So, there is a delta T between them. Now, that delta T amount of heat to be supplied okay, 
to your um, sample so that uh, the temperature will remain same for both the sample and the reference. Okay. So, the delta t between the sample and the reference should must be 0. So, that is the concept of actually DSC, how the DSC operates. This heat flow is recorded as a function of time or uh, temperature. Now, uh, on phase change such as crystallization or melting, either heat is evolved or adsorbed by the sample causing the sample to require more or less heat to melt. This is what I was just telling that either the sample will uh, degrade uh, by taking heat or um, by releasing heat. So, any change in state will be shown and the temperature at which it occurs will be recorded. Now, usually up to 725 degree centigrade and with low temperature at almost up to minus 175 degree. This is the range of DSC that can be most of the commercial DSC uh, uh, manufacturer uh, they operate in uh, this particular range minus 175 to 725. Now, uh, when actually the baseline shifts in uh, the DSC curves, so then we can understand that the glass transition region is going on. And uh, in, in case of endothermic events, there can be exothermic events also. So, endothermic events are melting, sublisa, sublimation, solid solid transitions, so, apart from dehydration, decomposition, chemical reaction, and reduction. So, um, whereas crystallization, solid solid transitions, decomposition, chemical reactions, oxidation, these are exothermic events. Now, let us understand this is a particular actually DSC plot. Okay. Right, it is a typical plot, okay. not all DSC plots will look like this. So, at constant pressure heat flow is equivalent to enthalpy changes. So, your dq by dt at constant pressure okay, equals to ds by dt because delta is equals to delta u plus p delta v. So, from that you can find out delta u equals to q p minus p delta v and so um, that heat flow difference between the sample and the, uh, the reference can be calculated in this equation. So, delta uh, ds dt is to ds by dt of sample minus ds by dt of the reference. Okay. Now, that is why it can be positive or negative. So, depending upon that only the heat will be supplied. Okay. So, heat flow difference can be either positive or negative. So, in endothermic process heat is absorbed. Okay. Right. So, heat flow to the sample is higher than that to the reference. So, your d h by d t is positive. So, in exothermic process the opposite is true and d h by d t is negative. So, what is the reference metal? What is its importance? Now, we understand the importance of reference metal. It is it is an inert metal mostly and it is not degrading uh, with whatever the amount of heat that is being supplied. Okay. So, it should not undergo any thermal events over the operating temperature range. Right. I am telling you about the characteristic features of the reference materials. So, both thermal conductivity and heat capacity of the reference should be similar to those of the sample. So, uh, for example, alumina uh, Al2O3 and SIC which is silicon carbide are used as reference materials for inorganic samples. Now, please remember that for organic and inorganic samples reference materials are different. Okay. Now, octyl thalate and silicon oil okay, are used as reference material for organic. Silicon oil is mostly used and uh, silicon carbide also mostly used. So, silicon oil and silicon carbide they are mostly used for as uh, reference material for inorganic and organic uh, um, samples. Now, please have a close look to this particular DSC curve. This is a representative DSC curve of a polymeric sample. So, you can see uh, dq by dt is plotted versus temperature. So, um, when we start the process we heat basically we start uh, we are heating in this direction right we are increasing the temperature. So, what is happening that uh, something will call there is a glass transition phase will come. Okay, this is a glass transition is a resign it is a phase it is not a particular uh, thing. Okay. Uh, temperature. So, from here we can find out the Tg, Tg here, Tg is the glass transition temperature. Now, what is happening? So, we can understand in a nutshell like that below Tg uh, the material will be crystalline okay. and when we go above Tg the glass transition temperature it will become rubbery like. Okay. So, uh, when we uh, further move across uh, uh, go ahead uh, beyond the glass transition temperature crystallization will occur. So, crystallization then followed by melting. Okay. So, the um, crystallization is exothermic process you can see here okay. whereas, melting is an endothermic process right. Then we uh, this is what is we are talking about baseline when there is a baseline as, as I told you now when there is a baseline shift then glass transition occurs. So, you can see here that till this point uh, okay, uh, there is no baseline change just when the glass transition occurs th there is a shift. Okay. So, this shift occurs. So, that means we can uh, immediately see from the plot uh, when the progress is happening actually the plot is getting uh, generated in your computer. 
So, you can see uh, when the baseline shift occurs then you can understand the glass transition regime starts. Okay. So, DC curve allows the glass transition temperature and the degree of crystallinity to be obtained. First order transition such as crystallization and melting gives narrow peaks and the peak area being proportional to the enthalpy change in the polymer and then the enthalpy change being related to the amount of crystalline material present. So, this allows you to um, estimate the degree of crystallinity basically. The glass transition corresponds to the second order transition. The second order transition can be characterized by a shift in the baseline resulting change in heat capacity. Uh, a glass transition temperature is the point of intersection of the tangent. The degree of crystallinity can be obtained from the area under the peak corresponding to the melting per unit uh, weight of the polymer. So, you basically calculate the area under the peak to uh, find out the uh, degree of crystallinity. Crystallinity and density are directly related to each other. So, as the degree of crystallinity increases, the density also increases because the density of crystalline region is greater than that of the amorphous region. Now, this implies that information on the degree of crystallinity can be obtained by density measurements. Now, the uh, next technique uh, or next uh, uh, technique to characterize non-porous membrane is the density measurement. Now, the density of polymer or its reciprocal of uh, reciprocal uh, that is specific volume is also very important parameter in many respects. Now, membrane material, but please, please again understand that since this is non-porous membrane, the membrane material in its properties plays a important role that is why density also plays a role. So, the membranes prepared using high density polymers tend to have lower permeability. So, the, from here you can understand uh, what is the importance of density actually. So, the density decreases, the specific volume increases as the temperature rises, but when glass transition temperature has been passed, the density decreases even rapidly. Now, uh, the overall density of polymer can be determined via a number of techniques such as pycnometry, uh, dilatometry and density gradient column. We will see uh, the density gradient column. So, uh, let us look at this particular image. So, this is a schematic representation of the density gradient column. What is happening is there two different types of liquids, one having high density, another having low density are mixed at different proportions in a mixing chamber and they are allowed to flow through a a density gradient column. So, this is just this is a simple column. Okay, you can see these are the columns actually, right. Okay. So, um, uh, you can see here different coloring agents are added okay, so as to differentiate two different uh, liquids with having different densities. Okay. Now, they will float here and they will settle here one upon uh, each other. Okay. You can see the from the color you can see and the flotation uh, value how much is that you can measure in centimeter actually and find out the density. So, the density gradient in the column is obtained by mixing the two liquids, one with the high density, another the low density. Upon aqueous inorganic solutions such as sodium bromide are used for polymers with density greater than 1 centimeter cube per gram. So, the overall density of the polymer sample can be obtained by measuring its flotation level. So, we are measuring the flotation level actually uh, from the density gradient column. So, we can measure density by Archimedes principle also very easy. So, the density determination of polymer may be performed by simple experiment okay, based on Archimedes principle. So, what is being happening here you can see here okay, a polymer sample has been immersed in a liquid with a non density. So, we are taking a polymer sample of which we want to measure the density, we are immersing it in a liquid whose density is known to us. Now, the upward pressure which is generated by immersion of polymer sample into the liquid is equal to the weight of the displaced volume and this can be measured by a balance. So, uh, how much actually upward pressure is generated when we are immersing this polymer sample in the liquid that should be equal to the weight of the displaced volume, how much amount of uh, liquid is being displaced and that can be measured by a balance. It is a very simple technique, this is a schematic of how uh, actually it is being done. Okay. So, the next is one of the most important and sophisticated uh, measurement technique, analytical technique which is called WAX, okay. a wide angle x-ray uh, diffraction or the XRD. So, uh, x-ray diffraction is another technique which can provide information about polymer morphology. Wide angle x-ray diffraction is an essentially good technique for obtaining information about size and shape of crystallite. So, what it gives us? It gives us the crystallinity the size and shape of crystallites in solid polymers. So, this is the schematic representation in a very uh, simple way I am showing you this. So, the incident range this is the sample on which the incident x-rays are falling. Okay. Then whatever is getting passed through this sample, but that means it is generating the secondary electrons those are getting detected. So, this is the angle Okay. This angle actually is called 2 theta. We will see in another uh, image that will be little more clear in this particular image. 
So, <coughs> as shown in this figure, an X-ray beam is allowed to impinge on the polymer. So, this is the polymer sample, right, on which the X-ray uh, beam actually um, is uh, uh, impinging on, and uh, uh, at a particular diffraction angle, right, that angle is called theta. Now, crystalline region shows coherent scattering patterns, and a sharp peak can be obtained in the diffraction versus uh, intensity curve, whereas an amorphous phase gives a broad peak. Uh, so, this is the scattering intensity, in, intensity versus the 2 theta, the angle. You can see the sharp peak here. This sharp peak is uh, due to the crystalline region, and amorphous region always gives this type of broader peaks, okay, right. So, uh, you can see this particular um, uh, this one uh, image here. So, here theta is the angle between the incident beam, right, right, this is theta, okay, is the angle between the incident beam and the crystallographic plane that generates the diffraction, right. And uh, 2 theta is the angle between this incident ray and if it is passing, you can see from here, okay, and whatever it is uh, getting diffracted. So, this is your 2 theta. Now, uh, you know um, in uh, earlier the XRD systems were theta theta systems. Now, most of the XRD students in uh, whatever it is available they are theta two theta system what is being shown here. Now, it is often difficult to discriminate between crystalline and amorphous scattering. It is very difficult actually which implies the degree of crystallinity cannot be estimated very accurately. Uh, the spacing between the two adjacent planes. So, these are atomic plane this is one atomic plane this is another atomic plane. Okay. So, you can see that uh, the distance between these two planes are given by uh, can be calculated from the Bragg's equation which is uh, this particular equation n lambda equals to 2 d sin theta. So, the d is the distance between the two atomic planes theta is this angle of incidence okay. and uh, lambda is the wavelength um, which is falling on the um, surface. Now, the next technique is called plasma etching. Now, plasma etching is a new technique which allows the measurement of the thickness of top layer in asymmetric and composite membrane. Now, please note this very importantly because this is one of the most important technique which will measure or will help us in characterize the asymmetric membranes, right? Those membranes which have a skin layer or a top layer. So, um, in composite membranes also. So, the uniformity of the structure in the top layer as well as the properties of the layer just within the top layer and the sub layer can also be determined. So, it is not that only the top layer is being characterized, we can characterize the sub layer also which is supporting basically. Now, the process involves a reaction between the surface poly polymeric membrane and a plasma that is produced in a glow discharge. Okay, this leads to slow removal of the top layer that uh, material itself is getting removed okay. and by the virtue of uh, plasma interaction what is happening that we get different types of um, vapors or volatile products such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, NOx, SOx and water. Okay. Um, so, let us see how this actually actually happening. So, this is a schematic representation. Okay. Here you are see oxygen is being used as the ionizing gas. Okay. So, when we put it inside a plasma uh, generating chamber, so it will ionize and it will uh, uh, generate what? It will generate oxygen radicals. Okay. So, you can see this. Okay. Now, they are heating to the membrane surface and then the degradation starts. So, we get carbon dioxide, carbon uh, monoxide, uh, water and other things. So, this particular figure is a low pressure plasma etching of a polytetrafluoroethylene uh, polymer. Okay. So, you can see how it happens actually this is a more uh, better schematic representation. So, here the gas is coming and then entering to this particular reactor plasma reactor basically uh, under the electrode discharge. Okay the gas will be generating uh, different types of radicals. Now, these radicals okay, is hitting the surface of the membrane okay, and then uh, it is degrading and then it is generating different different uh, uh, other uh, components such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, your um, uh, this was stox, nox depending upon actually what is uh, the composition of the particular polymer. So, by measuring the gas transport properties as a function of the etching time, information can be obtained about the morphology and the thickness of the thin non-porous top layer. Now, because the top layer thickness are generally within the range of 0.1 to 5 micron, the etching rate must be below. For small etching time, only when a portion of the top layer is removed, it is expected that the selectivity should be unchanged. This is a good process actually, good technique. However, uh, little uh, costly apparatus is required because we are talking about generating plasma. 
Now the next methods are surface analysis methods. So in composite membranes, the membrane properties are determined by the extremely thin layer, the top layer or the skin layer. So when this layer is applied via polymerization reaction, uh, so uh, we have discussed about all these techniques, no? the techniques to make asymmetric membranes or composite membranes, so such as poly plasma polymerization, interficial polymerization or in situ polymerization, the chemical nature of the layer is not known exactly. So that is why you need to characterize it. So, the outermost part of the material that is its surface is an extremely sensitive part which bears the surface characteristics. So, what are those? So, the chemical activity, adhesion, wetness, electrical properties, optical properties, corrosion resistance, friction and biocompatibility of the material. And it is also a part that it is prone to losing such characteristics by degradation and contamination of the environment, adhesion of the process residues, etc. So, you can see there are so many surface properties, these are all of them plays a certain role Okay, when the separation is actually going on uh, through the membrane. Now, in order to examine a solid surface, the surface must be first stimulated to examine the signals that appears. So, uh, to stimulate that we can use either light or x-rays and electrons, okay, different types of electrons okay, for surface stimulation. So, among the various signals that appear as a result of such surface stimulation, particles such as electrons and anodes that are only given up by the surface. So, what actually we are doing is that we are using light, x-ray or electrons to stimulate the surface. So, once the, stim once the surface is getting stimulated, the surface is emitting certain electrons right, or ions, whatever it is. So, that uh, what is being emitted is being actually observed or uh, being uh, uh, that is goes to the detector that is being detected actually. So, um, uh, um, their properties are analyzed to reveal the chemical structure of the surface. So, under these techniques, we will discuss th uh, three different uh, uh, analytical uh, methods. One is called XPS, then is one, uh, then the next is TOSIMS and another is AES. So, let us first see the AES which is called Auger Electron Spectroscopy. So, uh, AES uh, the electron beams are irradiated on samples and the generated Auger electrons are observed to perform the qualitative quantitative analysis of the surface. We can have both qualitative and quantitative measurement. So, basically it is something like electron microscope you can understand and correlate with that. So, electrons are being uh, or x-ray is being actually uh, put on the surface of the membrane material and it will generate some electrons right. Uh, in same also, uh, it will generate the electron, those are called secondary electron. Now, the secondary electrons are actually detected. We are not uh, talking about any that is uh, uh, any other uh, electrons. So, only the secondary electrons are being detected. So, here other electrons are uh, detected, there may be some other um, electrons also. So, uh, since the primary excitation line with AES is electrons, it can function as an electron scaling microscope, right. So, um, that is what I was telling about uh, SAM and uh, FESM. Additionally, it is characterized by extremely high spatial resolution compared to other surface analytic methods. So, the resolution is extremely high in AES. So, AES demonstrates its strength mainly in the observation of metal and semiconductor surfaces and micro level foreign substances on surface. It is a very good uh, technique. I will show you a sketch later on. Okay. The next method is TUFS SIMS, uh, it is actually called time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry. So, what is happening in this? So, it is a technique in which high speed ions are irradiated to analyze secondary ions that is emitted from the surface. Now, it is characterized by an extremely high surface sensitivity, thus um, its ability to obtain organic compound molecular mass information and to perform high sensitivity inorganic elemental analysis. Now, uh, in the past it was mostly used for surface metallic contamination and organic material analysis hmm, usually for the semiconductors and display materials. Uh, we, while more recently it has been used for the analysis of organic matter distribution and segregation on organic material surfaces. Now, SIMS make uh, use of primary ions as the exciting source with secondary ions being the emission products that is being detected. So, argon and xenon are usually used as the noble gas ions which can penetrate the solid of few atomic layers that is why actually their penetration capability is more that is why they are being used. With a small excitation they actually uh, um, go to a um, uh, very with a small amount of uh, this one uh, excitation. So, uh, they actually uh, penetrate very deep. So, they can go to the sub layer or the support layer also. So, all elements and compounds can be determined with this technique, problem may occur due to the charge buildup and ion induced reaction at the surface. 
So, the next method is called XPS, which is called X ray photo electron spectroscopy. So, it is one of the most important met analytical method. People, those who are working with uh, membrane materials, uh, then your uh, adsorbents, catalysts, and all, okay. So, they have to go through all the, the XPS uh, actually analyti an analysis. So, it is a technique in which X rays are irradiated to analyze the energy of photo electrons generated by the photoelectric effect. This is how it is different from the usual XRD. Okay. So, it is characterized by its ability to analyze surface composition and chemical bonding states. So, I, I was telling you know, it is very important to uh, important XPS is very important for uh, catalysts, um, uh, polymeric materials like uh, for membrane and all applications as well as adsorbents because of this chemical bonding state. So, it will tell me the bonding uh, state actually as well as the composition. Now, the binding energies of the electrons in the molecules are measured that is what uh, how much energy is there that can be measured and the absolute binding energy of electrons in a given elements of fixed values and the characteristics of that ele element. Now, differences in the chemical environment will lead to small changes in the binding energies that will result in the chemical shift. Now, the chemical shift depends on the nature of the binding as well as electronegativity of the attached group. Now, its analysis area is limited to several microns at most, but it can be used for the surface analysis of various materials regardless of whether they are organic or inorganic. So, we have seen the three methods. Now, next slide is showing you understanding or Im uh, in the form of images of this particular three methods which we discussed uh, the AES, the TOF SIMS and the XPS. Uh, in case of AES, the resolution is very high, uh, the, it is 3 nanometer, uh, for TOF SIMS it is 100 nanometer, for XPS it is 100 micron. And these are the images actually micro analysis, so, this is the uh, image obtained from the analysis uh, from the, uh, you can see the uh, uh, what we are measuring is uh, the agar electron, this is not being measured right. In AES what we are measuring is the secondary ion not this one not the secondary electron ok in case of TOPS SIMS and what we are measuring in XPS is the photo electron ok not this secondary electron. So, please uh, uh, see this is in a nutshell in a this single picture will tell you the differences between AES, TOPS SIMS and XPS. Okay. And these are the corresponding um, uh, images from the analysis, you can see uh, this is the resolution at 1 micron, this is a 20 micron, this is 500 micron. Okay. In uh, XPS we are able to see the oxide nitride and um, uh, different phases also, right. So, uh, students uh, today we discussed about the characterization of this non-porous membranes okay, and, um, and ionic membranes also. So, you can use this uh, um, references and books actually, Mulder is the text as I keep on telling you and apart from other books also like uh, Richard Baker and Cherian to for, for this uh, for today's topic, most it is taken from uh, the Mulder. So, um, uh, thank you very much. In the next class, we are going to, so our characterization uh, is uh, topics are over. So, once we characterization is over, as I discussed in the introductory lecture, what is the next is basically we need to understand the transport, okay, before we move on to uh, particular uh, um, processes. Uh, now, uh, in the transport, we will discuss about the uh, mem membrane transport, uh, how the transport is happening, uh, what is passive transport, what is active transport, then uh, phenomenological equation, driving force and we will discuss in a nutshell, in a brief actually the non-equilibrium thermodynamics. The Onsager's reciprocating relationship, it is very important, okay. When you go for any design of membrane processes, you must uh, understand this actually. So, then only you can uh, model and design a particular membrane process. So, thank you very much. So, you have any query, please uh, drop a mail to me at kmahanthi at iitg.ac.in. Thank you. Thank you.